On today's Locked on Cavs, here is how good Donovan Mitchell is. Because it was your spoiler alert. He was really great. We'll talk all about that on a new Locked on Cavs. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com backslash locked in NBA. And when you enter the code locked in NBA, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti Stout Tumbler with every order. I am Chris Manning covering the Cavs and the NBA at large for place for place like Diamond Up Rocks, uh, SB Nation, Cleveland Magazine, all of that great stuff. That man over there is Evan Damerel, the founder of Independence. I write down Euclid, which covers the entire Cleveland sports scene. As always, Jake Stevens is producing. Today's show, segment one, how good Donovan Mitchell was last year as we wrap up talking about the shooting guard this week. Segment two, Mitchell's on-off numbers and and some of what those look like. And segment three, Karis LeVert via the numbers, what he was and what that says about what his value might be this summer. But Evan, to start with Donovan Mitchell, I'm going to hit you with some numbers. Lay it on me. All right. Number one, he had 71 in a game. Just let's remind people of that. He had 71 in a game. I think that's pretty good. Segment two, and this is all that mostly a lot of these for, are from dunks and threes. He was fourth among all guards in expected wins. Only Luca, SGA, and Dame had more ex, um, expected wins added than him. So pretty great. Estimated plus minus per 100 possessions. He's eighth in guards in that stat. Dame, Luca, Steph, Shea, Kyrie, weird, Halliburton, and Harden ahead of him. Seventh based among guards in expected. Uh, plus minus per hundred possessions among among guards, so a top seven offensive guard for the year, just in terms of that stat. Eleventh in that category overall. Stat line for the year: twenty eight point three per game, forty eight point four percent from the field, thirty eight point six percent from three, sixty one point four percent true shooting percentage. That is the first time in his career that he had a true shooting percentage north of sixty percent. Evan, this this is where I, I, I want to go with this. And this is what I want to use to talk about this in a in a constructive way, not just gushing and, and being whatever. A, is this the apex of Mitchell's career? And B, can he get better or sustain this level of offensive production going forward? I think those are both valid questions. Um, because this was the best season of his NBA career, which again is Hard to conceive just considering how good he's been from go since he joined the NBA coming out of Louisville many moons ago. But if you just look at through the lens of the postseason, he wasn't great and especially just didn't live up to maybe what the expectations he set heading into the postseason were because it just is such a wonderful and amazing regular season. And you would hope at least that. In terms of just performance, the next level for him is one, just bouncing back from two mediocre postseasons in a row and just kind of proving to not only Cavs fans or people who watch the NBA abroad or just Cleveland's front office and his teammates like, hey, this is why y'all traded the farm for me and came and got me because you already had something going and I'm here to push you over the edge and take you to that next level. And uh, so I want to say yes, just because it was so surprising to see him have I don't want to say a dramatic leap, but like a pretty sizable jump in terms of production from what he was last year with Utah. And sure, there's a lot of frustrations with the situation in general, maybe him just wanting to move on. But I didn't quite expect this dramatic of a jump. Like, yeah, there's a 71 point game, but like the fact that he was just so hyper efficient and just kind of running so consistently hot on a night to night basis really gives you some pretty lofty expectations to begin with. And you at least want to hope that there's the drive and desire to build off of a stinker of a postseason and just kind of maybe prove a lot of your doubters and naysayers wrong. And also just the fact that him going from Utah to Cleveland was a pretty big and dramatic shift for him. And now it's just kind of maybe figuring out the minutia and the little things just to kind of coexist and uh, function in harmony with Darius Garland and kind of like hit his game in ways that aren't like tangible statistically or moving through advanced metrics. It's from, from the old fashioned eye test, but I think it's possible um, that he could hit another level, but also maybe this is his apex and he kind of plateaus, which if he does and he sustains this level of play, like that's a really good spot to be in if you're the Cavs or Mitchell. 
I think this is right towards like the apex of, of what his career could be from like a regular season standpoint. I think next year he could be close to this. I don't necessarily think you want, I think you want something that is more um, maybe just kind of takes a little of the pressure of him to kind of carry everything at times. I think that's always that's, kind of an optimal place to be. That's valid because there were a lot of nights he carried the Cavs, especially on offense and maybe you don't want him doing a lot of what he did with the jazz part two with the Cavs. The other part of this, I, I think, is that obviously the playoffs are going to dictate how we feel about a lot of this. Now he's had two playoffs in a row where his team has lost in the first round and a third or something that doesn't sustain him is going to look kind of make us look differently, I think, at some of this. I think, though, this is a guy that is in the prime of his career. I think this season was a year where he's coming in at age 26. He's in the prime. He has got a point to prove. And I think next year could be very much the same. I don't know if he's going to like have 71 in a game again. I don't know if, you know, he's going to be someone that's going to be first or second team all NBA again. Like, I mean, all NBA teams are really hard to make. This is the first time he's ever made one. Is it possible? Yes. Could he have a really close to this level of season and like just get a little bit unlucky and not make it? Yeah. Like if he just happens to miss some time with injury and like play 62 games like that'll knock him out. That's like the kind of where you, you you're going to have some players, whether it's Mitchell or not, have seasons like that. This is just very much a guy, I think, in his prime. And I think particularly as he goes forward, this is his window. You know, this is Mitchell's 26 to 30 is going to be the prime of his career, the prime of his basketball life. I I think you're hoping that this is kind of like where he's going to be at. And that obviously needs to carry over to postseason success. You know, that I think coming off of this year, coming off of his last year and and what he has said about what he wants. Mm hmm. I think these are these are kind of two separate. Pa- There's two paths here. It is we're gonna talk about how great he was in the regular season. We're doing that here. There's also okay. How does that translate to the postseason? And two years in a row, it it hasn't been great for whatever reason. Yeah, and it is interesting um, to look at Donovan Mitchell through that lens, just because he is an outstanding regular season player, and there are moments where he has done incredible incredible things for the jazz and i'm sure people say like oh it was during the bubble blah 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 whatever but like there's even moments before the bubble that like mitchell did some lot of just crazy out-of-pocket stuff and just really carried the load for utah and i think the desire is still there it's just like you said maybe it's the stuff that was within mitchell's control and maybe he was pressing too much maybe he was trying to force up shots that he thought he could make and You saw in game two against the Knicks more so him just kind of taking on that primary playmaker role and just feeding off of Garland and his teammates, just carrying the momentum offensively. Like there's ways he can be effective without having to score the basketball. And we've seen that time and again this season for the Cavs. And I think they need to tap into more of that. And also, this is a very flawed team, a very top heavy team. And you maybe saw Mitchell burn himself out towards the end of the year because the Cavs were expecting him just kind of carry and shoulder the offensive load especially when things got tight and the youth and experience from the coaching staff and the rest of the roster really showed. And then when Mitchell didn't have it, everything fell apart to the wayside. So I think it's a maturation and growing up process on the Cavs side of things. Uh, Like you said, I want to believe Mitchell and just the him saying that like, listen, I was not great two years in a row and I need to work on it and be better. And he said all the right things um, at the end of Cleveland season and also during his exit interviews as well. That at least gives you reason for optimism, like heading into next season and just kind of like whatever the future holds for both him and the Cavs. But we'll, we'll see how it goes, just because it is a little inexplicable just to watch how dramatic of a drop off it was scoring wise, where it just seemed like he was not going through the motions, but certainly pressing quite a bit and trying to maybe be that spark for the Cavs and just not letting a shot or not having his shot fall the way he's used to. And. Maybe it was New York's defensive pressure for some of it, but a lot of it was it felt like Mitchell pressing, just kind of going back and doing a full autopsy of the one series Cleveland played. All right, we're going to talk about his on-off numbers coming up next and what those mean. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs recently sent us Lockdown Host some free product. And I mean, I got to say, I'm, I'm loving these. these bird dogs. The Tumblr is great. I know you. the second time you're hawking it, you're just, you were meant to hawk things. But right, you know, yesterday, I wore a pair... That's true. I wore their shorts to work and they were extremely comfortable to wear into the office in a professional setting. And when I went on a midday walk to get some fresh air and some vitamin D, the shorts were great on the walk. And then afterwards, I went to dinner for my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. And I wore the shorts to that too. And I fit in and they look great. These are super versatile, super comfortable shorts 
that allow mm-hmm. you to wear them to the golf course, to a meeting, on a date, or hanging out with friends. And they make pants too, which is awesome. They fit great. I can't wait to get some more of these, get pants, get all the whole stock. So my whole closet is a brew dog. Cause these really might only, these might end up being the only pants and shorts that I own. They're that freaking comfortable. So go to birddogs.com backslash locked in NBA and you enter the promo code locked in NBA. They'll throw in a free custom bird dog Yeti style tumbler with every order. Evan, show them. Show them again. I'll show you the I'll show you the tumbler, folks. It has a little bird, it has the logo. And if you like the bird dog logo, it is on the bottom, which is weighted, so it does not slide because my cat's a bit of a jerk and likes to smack cups around, but he found this one to be ineffective. So my bedside table was not soaking wet when I woke up the next morning. Go get that today. Birddogs.com backslash locked in NBA when you enter that promo code locked in NBA. Thanks for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. Every day I was back on Monday. We're going to transition to the shooting guard position. And we're going to wonder what the future holds for one Isaac Okora. All right, Evan. Jonathan Mitchell on off numbers last year. Look, look, Evan, I have been, you know this. The listeners know this. I'm in my Chris is being positive and more optimistic about life era. Chris is bring the energy, bring the energy era. And sometimes if that comes across aggressive to you, I am just bringing the heat, baby. Let's go. Let's you do some podcast personality. I'd definitely say that I am bringing it. I am bringing the energy all caps. Let's ride. Plus 2.1 per hundred possessions. Cavs were with Mitchell on the floor. Mm-hmm. Plus 3.9 per hundred on offense. Uh, these stats with, you know, what, what falls in line with the rest of the league are pretty good. You know, some of the best numbers of his career in this sense. Evan, this is where I that my question goes though. Mm-hmm. A is this sustainable for them to just kind of be somewhat have Mitchell kind of dra- dragging some things forward, and B, how can the Cavs better support Mitchell when he sits? And you know, and this applies to Darius Garland. Some of this applies to Garland as well. How can they support their two guys when it's just one of them mm-hmm. on the floor? Again, these are val- like segment one. These are valid questions. Thank A you. lot of Mitchell. Or the Cavs maybe being so overly reliant on Mitchell is the offense did fall apart more often than not if like when Darius Garland wasn't available or maybe didn't have it and Mitchell sat and you saw the Cavs lean on him quite a bit, especially towards the end of the season uh, as things wrapped up. And you saw it happen in the postseason too, where like the Cavs needed somebody to give them some type of offensive spark. And they only got it in their well, one of the series when the Cavs just kind of tried the unconventional and let Mitchell be the primary ball handler and creator for everybody else. But I, a lot of it, and this can go hand in hand with uh, the episode from the day prior where we talked about just free agency options. Like the Cavs need to find shooting. They need to find just proper wing depth. They maybe need to find guys that are just able to play off of Mitchell as low usage players because Mitchell is an awesome three-point shooter. Like he upped Cleveland's three-point percentage numbers just by himself because of how many he takes per game. But like he does like getting to the basket and he does like attacking the rim and defenses will have to respect that and close out on him. And the Cavs need to take advantage of that and build offensive momentum. And sure, some of that can be Darius Garland or a lot of that can be Darius Garland as well, just becoming more comfortable without the ball in his hands and kind of just maybe playing. You saw it a lot again in game two where like Mitchell was bending New York's defense with his gravity and getting Garland really clean and wide open looks. And you need guys are able to take advantage of those looks and opportunities just to make life easier to one, build the sizable enough lead that affords you to rest Mitchell when you can, or two gets guys in a groove and going offensively enough that if there's a night, Mitchell doesn't have it, or there's a night where you're like, okay, we're playing a team that has aspirations for the draft lottery versus the playoffs. We can afford to rest some of our dudes, Mitchell being one of them. And you don't want to lose the game or maybe just disrupt the flow of what you have going. Like there's a lot of things you can go about this. I think a lot of it's on the front office just to maximize this. Um, And also just for Mitchell's sake, like not press as much if his shot isn't going because there is something there where he works really well as a playmaker for the Cavs and just they're like, all right, Don, you're the, you're the point for all of our offensive sets for like the next five to six minutes. And like, he's really good at moving the basketball. Like that's something I was really surprised by this season other than, the commitment to defense. Um, so there's a lot of things that could work, but I just think a lot of it is a depth issue at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I think there's like times where like the, the ball movement stuff we've, we've had that discussion. I think there are, there are things with Mitchell, you know, like that. I think the ball movement kind of got stuck in the playoffs and that's a problem. I, mm-hmm. I think this, this speaks to like the depth problem that just kind of has that like the, the, this roster is very much, Garland and Mitchell and then Mobley and Allen and then it's like you're kind of 
you don't feel like you trust a lot of those guys. You did like clearly Bickerstaff didn't trust Okoro. It's, it's There's some not, limitations with Levert. Like you go down this list yeah. and it's like, like this roster. You're in the playoffs. You're just like hoping something would stick and throwing Ricky Ruby out there when it was clear that that wasn't oh going to work. I, I think like the rest of this roster is has to get like redeveloped and reshuffled, and that's how you better support Mitchell. Maybe then you don't like. There's going to obviously be games a year. The Bulls game we're in at 71 is the, the apex example of this. When he just dragged them to a win by kind of putting them on his back and willing them mm-hmm. in that way. You can't really like need that to happen. And, and I think just kind of having a deeper, trying to develop a deeper roster and getting to that place, even if your rotation sinks down to eight or nine in the playoffs, I, I think that would just kind of better serve Mitchell to kind of maybe sustain some of the highs we've seen from him. So the, the world isn't on him for 82 games a year. I agree with that. And to your point, it's a lot, at least to me, felt like a lot of, okay, Darius and Donovan, we need you to do Darius and Donovan things individually to carry us on offense. Whereas you look at like Jarrett and Evan, we need you to do Jarrett and Evan things on defense to kind of counterbalance what they're doing on offense. Like there's just that lack of connectivity between both ends of the floor for the Cavs. So like they need to find that cohesive identity still. And they looked further ahead of schedule than I maybe had hoped um, when Mitchell first came here. And there's a strong enough foundation to build upon, but it's the lack of depth and the co- lack of cohesion. And I think a lot of it could be as well, like the lack of just Isaac Okoro taking that year three leap, or he was able to be that connective tissue between both ends of the floor to kind of give the Cavs a little bit of comfort and familiarity. And I don't know, there's a... <sighs> There's more questions than there are answers about the Cavs as the postseason wrapped up, and I'm still trying to find some of the answers for them as I just like look back and review how the playoffs went or just kind of like look back at some of the highs and lows from the regular season as well. And there's a lot of things the Cavs need to fix, and their options are limited, as we stressed on the show the other day, but and we stressed a lot during this offseason too, but the, the Cavs need to get creative so they can avoid those scenarios where like they're turning to a still recovering Ricky Rubio to maybe provide them off that offensive spark when maybe it should have been Karis LeVert coming off the bench instead, or maybe like you're like, Oh shoot, maybe the Cavs shouldn't have said nobody moved their needle for us at the deadline and maybe made more of a concerted effort to look at one of these players that were available at the deadline. Like there's a lot of questions and stuff you can rack your brain over, but the simple fact of the matter is, is Cleveland just lacks the depth to kind of just maximize and connect like these two pretty strong balanced identities that you're, building in real time all right after this carousel verd via the numbers what he was last year and what that means for his value and how we understand it evan here here's my goal with what we're going to do here i my, i want to look at what lavert is and what he does and, and how this kind of makes us think about his value reasonably in the open market so dunks and threes had him as expected wins of four it's a lot less like than Mitchell, let's say, you know, is expected plus minus per hundred is minus 0.3. So like he's close to about an even player per hundred possessions. He was minus 1.5 on offense, plus 1.2 on defense, which was the career best of his by wide margin. Cleaning the glass has him as an overall on off is minus 3.8 per hundred on offense, minus 3.4, you know, overall. I, I think... You know, I mean, we we did a thing earlier this week where we talked about what we think he's going to get. And I think it could be up to like 18, like somewhere in that 15, 18 range, mm-hmm. just from like a trade aspect standpoint. I think there's like a real argument to be made that if the Cavs were not in this position, I, I don't think I would maybe be going close to that. And that kind of colors me. Should you do that in the first? Because I think if you look at kind of these things where it's like he's close to even in terms of the expected plus minus, you know, he's kind of like rates out as a slight negative, And this is. For his career, he's never been like a, a guy that is dry, like has like really great splits or whatever in this in this way and viewing him in this way. It, it kind of makes me wonder. It's like, OK, like, should I be even just trade him? Is that number like worthwhile doing in case you do get stuck with it or something? So to your point, getting stuck with it is an actuality. Uh, we talked about this when we dove into Karis LeVert a little bit more in detail the other day where. If he's able to sustain just the, I wouldn't say crazy three-point shooting numbers he had this year, but is able to kind of just sustain and maybe carry some of that momentum he had from this year on the next season because he wasn't great in the mid-range, but he was pretty good at three-point shooting for the Cavs. Maybe he wasn't the most consistent, but at least made them more often than not for Cleveland. 
it becomes a tougher pill to swallow if you sign him to 18 to maybe 18 and a half or even 19 million a year and it's beyond like a two-year deal with the second year being like a team or a player option where you can just reapproach it uh next free agency or even it's a kobe Owen special where it's partially guaranteed but that's where it gets murky and tricky if it goes in like a three four year extension for the Cavs and Levert. And sure, you I have made the argument and anyone can make the argument that wings are a premium commodity no matter how you shake it. And Karis Levert at least has the intrigue and upside of a player who fits that mold of a two three player that can uh, provide you a little bit of everything. But mostly it's like scoring and some tertiary playmaking. And I think maybe the defensive stuff that we saw towards the end of the season and be more malleable as well for Cleveland. like. Certainly helps his case as a trade candidate, but if he comes back down to earth, if this was just like Karis LeVert looking really strong in a contract year to kind of maximize his earnings, that could be an issue, of course. But obviously, you ride this out as you go. I, again, would be surprised at this point if LeVert isn't back with Cleveland next season on some type of extension, but it's the years and the numbers when that becomes public or at least just like leaked or just shared to like Woj or Shams or anybody else. Um, that gives me perspective on how maybe the Cavs feel about Karis LeVert going forward long term. Because if it's like a three, four year deal, I'm like, okay, the, the Cavs envision like maybe he's a trade chip down the line, but at least for the foreseeable future, LeVert is kind of locked in as the team's six man. And they're trying to maybe build around like the five players that have an offensive pulse for them on any given night. And they kind of flesh out the rotation and vision from there. But if it's one or two years, or well, I'll even say three, but like the third year is an option. I'm going to say, okay, the Cavs maybe view him more as a trade asset where they're like, okay, the market isn't great. Uh, We retained one of our own guys, quote unquote, that we traded for last year. And we'll reevaluate as we go. And if it doesn't work or if we maybe find a more tangible upgrade, we can use Karras as an asset then if he's able to either sustain the play or at least, you know, you can sell other teams on the upside and intrigue. Just the fact that he is or at least fits the bill of a wing size player or type player. Is he better than like a? Is he better than twelve million dollars a year? Like, if you're gonna say like actually, like in reality, you could just sign him for what he's actually kind of worth. Is he worth like the mid, like the mid level more than the what the mid level exception is? I think hmm. no. I don't think so either. Um, I'm trying to look at like number of players that are comp. As I scroll on this list a little bit, so. What is so would he fit in the mold of like money that Josh Hart, Dorian Finney Smith, uh, Kelly Oubre is currently making? Maybe Josh Richardson as well. Like maybe if you look at those guys, it makes more sense. But like going forward, that's a tougher pill to swallow. But sometimes NBA money is a bit like monopoly money too, especially with like new TV deals on the horizon and just new financial ventures everywhere you turn and just how like financially flush the league is becoming in general. So like, I don't weep for what millionaires and billionaires are spending, but it's tough. Um, Like Doug McDermott is currently making 3.75. We'll say 13, sorry, not 3.75, 13.75, 13.8 million per year. We'll just round it up. Would you say he's kind of in like that range or would he be closer to more like, yeah, he's a $12 million player because like that's what Kelly Oubre and Dorian Finney-Smith and Josh Hart and even Josh Richardson are currently making. Yeah, I think Lovert has leverage that's going to get him more money and I, I think that deserves a lot of praise. I, I also think like this is this feels very circumstantial for how he's going to get more like i i don't i don't think there's just like a compelling picture in the numbers in the film whatever Mm -hmm. it's like an 18 million dollar year play even if the price of the of the contracts is going up and the mid-level's gone up in the last couple years yeah 18 just feels like i i still even like i'm kind of bracing for it and and to to know that it's coming so we can like react to it and just that that's Mm -hmm. just kind of in talking to people about it that's the number that 18 is like the ceiling and kind of like a reasonable thing Bobby Mark said that out there in his thing as well. It just feel it just feels a little bit high to me for what he is. It does, um, and it's not that and, he's like and, not useful. No, it's just that like we're not he's like not trying like, to like crap on Karis the Bird here. Like, no, he it's is just, useful it, as a player, but it's there just is like a limit is he, to yeah. how useful he is. And to your point, he also does have the added ammunition of and munition of the fact that 
it's a really thin market for like perimeter or wing type players. And I don't want to say Levert is like one of the better names available because I think Kyle Kuzma is going to get locked up pretty quick by the Wizards. But in terms of just like unrestricted free agents, like it's a pretty murky market. Like Joe Harris is oft injured and he could be a name out there. Um, Harrison Barnes, like if you leave Sacramento, like how in love with you are him or how in love with him are you in terms of like offensive upside? Like, all of these dudes have flaws, but like Karis LeVert can say like, okay, at least I'm a bona fide bucket compared to some of these guys. And he can also also add into the clip like, hey, last season was my healthiest season after a lot of injury mm. issues in Brooklyn and Indiana and also that cancer scare. Like he has not a lot, but quite a bit of positive momentum in his corner heading into this offseason just for him personally. Yeah. All right. Let's end there. Back on Monday. Diving in to the small forward position, starting with Isaac Coro. Thanks for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. And thanks to Jake Stevens for his wonderful work on production.